All right. So, uh, unlike Torsten, uh, I wasn't hacking slides until five minutes ago, but the reason for that is not that uh, uh, I was so much more ready with my slides. It was rather that I had so little to talk about that the slide deck was so small. So, um, this is me, so I'm doing LibreOffice on Ubuntu, but I'm also working uh, a bit on uh, LibreOffice itself, and one of the, my, my most insane ideas was Bibersect. Uh, some years ago, who here knows what bisecting is? Torsten talked about that. Okay. Who knows what bi bisecting is? Okay, roughly half of the audience, which is great, so I can waste some time explaining bisecting. Um, <laughs> so imagine LibreOffice 5.2.0 is working great for you and uh, your document is rendering fine and everything is beautiful. And in LibreOffice uh, 521, suddenly your text is red, although it shouldn't. So imagine this is LibreOffice 5.0, and this over there, the other end, is LibreOffice 5.0, uh, 5, this is 5.2.0, and this is 5.2.1. So and there are 128 commits in between. And if you ask the developers who of you guys broke it, what's the answer? Not me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everyone is saying not me. And in this case, that's true because I did break it. And of course, I, I don't know that, but I did so. And this is the commit where I broke it. It's somewhere here. But I'm not aware of that. So you're sitting here, you're not knowing where, where the stuff broke. So what can you do? You know it's, broke, it's broken here, it's okay there. So you go into the middle and you test your document. And is the text red or is the text black? Which color is it? It's broken, right. So I know that uh, these 64 commits broke it. I go here. Red or black, is it broken or not? Not. It's working, okay. So I've got 32 commits to my left. And go into the middle, now it's 16 commits to my right. Is it working or not? It's not working, okay, it's there. Okay, now, no, actually I can just look at these 16 commits and probably find out that it was me. So. Speaking of breaking things. <clears throat> so this is roughly how uh, bisection works, except that for LibreOffice it's a bit different because usually with each step you have to compile the whole product, which is a pain with a product uh, the size of LibreOffice. So uh, we created all these binaries and put them into a Git repository so you can do it on the binaries. But that leads to pretty big downloads. So if someone has, uh, wants to find out if something breaks, he has to download like a few gigabytes of uh, a repository just to find that out. So it would be great to uh, make that lighter. And I looked into that, but I have to tell you, no idea what I'm talking about. I did mostly application development, and uh, I don't know that much about like uh, more development closer to the system. But one of the basics is that uh, in Unix everything is a file and there's one path and at that, that location you will find a specific thing. That was true in Unix for a long time, but actually that is not that true anymore for quite a few reasons. Um, there are some containers and uh, solutions that make actually different trees be available in the same thing. And you can use that, for example, to uh, create um, a specific view on the file system. So you already saw this, this thing. 
um, it, like Snappy, for example, um, and other uh, solutions, it would be great to, to really be able to switch between these versions without having um, some intermediate half state. And it would also be great to be able to roll back. Now, most of this stuff is done by Snappy or also by Flatpak and solutions like that. But we really want to have this, this uh, solution for having many, many, many different installations and not having to install them all at the same time, which is a bit of a different problem. But if you look at, um, at Git, how it, is, um, how it is set up, it's actually a content addressable file system, and that means that once you have a specific file and you have a different commit that also has this file with the same content, it actually stores not two files, but it's just the same stuff. So it does deduplication in a way, which is great for reducing the amount of data you need. And it has it stores all this stuff in very simple objects, which are blocks, uh, blobs, which is just the content, trees, which is a directory, essentially, and commits, which is pointing to a tree, which uh, contains the state of the file system. So, um, like I said, uh, in 2011, I did BiBisect and started off with this. And um, OS3 was, was uh, something similar at like GNOME. But uh, that was the starting point for LibreOffice. And I could put uh, 755 images of LibreOffice into just one repository of uh, 12 gig, which was a good starting point, because that means 16 gigs, uh, 60 megs for just one installation. But you still had to download the whole thing to really get started with this. Actually, that's not current data. That's uh, half a year old, so just skip over that. So I wondered if we can solve this problem with, uh, of course, there's an XKCD for it, because there's an XKCD for everything. And um, this XKCD essentially says, why don't we download stuff on the fly when we need it? And the summary is below. I felt pretty clever until I realized that I reinvented web pages. But actually, these days, there's not much difference between a web page and um, a desktop application because this happened by, by now. <clears throat> so an average web page these days is bigger than... than uh, Desktop, whole desktop applications were back in the day. So um, our networks got this good and this fast and have so much bandwidth that we don't need to um, think in the same terms that we did back in the days when, when a desktop application was just one thing. So my idea was actually to have a Git repository somewhere. And if you want to buy bisect on this, Git repository, or you want to use content from that, you create a fuse mount, so a dynamically generated mount, and whenever you actually want to look at that file, in that moment, you download the file actually from the Git repository. So that was my idea, and I did that proof of concept with a ugly Python script in 2013, and um, well, it was slow, because it was Python, and the Python script used uh, forked shell commands, and these forked shell commands then downloaded stuff. So that is obviously not, not quick. But uh, I could uh, have a BiBiSec uh, repository somewhere and start LibreOffice out of this repository uh, remotely, essentially. So it was downloading on the fly uh, on first start. It was slow, but it worked. And what I could see, for example, is that um, starting off LibreOffice for the first time, just to get to the start center, um, the whole installation in a BiBiSec repo is roughly 250 megs. But to the first, to the start center, only 75 megs of that are actually read. 
So if you just want to test one specific case, like you do with bivisecting, you don't need 250 megs of data, you just need these uh, 75 megs. So that is quite a lot already, quite a different uh, difference. Um, so yeah, th this was just a proof of concept and uh, um, the <laughs> I did process isolation back then just as a hack. Uh, I looked up with which, uh, which process ID um, was looking for a file and then giving this process the, the LibreOffice that was there and then you could switch the file system and actually have a different LibreOffice there and start a second one. That I, I thought that was a great idea until I realized that uh, the dynamic linker gets very confused if, if uh, a file at the same location suddenly has different contents for different processes. But um, this kind of stuff is much better solved by solutions like uh, namespaces, Docker, Snappy, Flatpak, whatever. Uh, so that was just, um, just experimentation. But um, the basic concept to have this, um, to dynamically download stuff on the fly, uh, worked because I could start LibreOffice from it, which is probably one of the most complex binaries you can, you can start on something like that. But yeah, it was hackish with Python and Git commands, and um, it navigated the paths remotely, so it, whenever you navigate through the directories, it always had to uh, check back the, the remote uh, location. And uh, yeah, it was not really something you could, you could use in production or even for bivisection. So this year, I uh, tried it a bit, bit better with... Uh, with using an actual proper language for something like that, which was Rust, and used uh, libgit and again Fuse, and um, had good tests on that, and essentially got the same thing with uh, a few things changed. Uh, for example, as I said, Git has not only the blobs as objects, but also the trees, which are the directories. So I also download the trees, and with that, I can locally uh, navigate the file system so the performance is better. And uh, other than that, it does mostly the same. If you, if you open a file, it uh, checks if the file is there. If the file is not there, it goes to the Git repository, downloads the Git repository, creates an uncompressed version in the local file system, and then just maps every file access to the local file. And all of that transparently, so you never see any download there. So you're opening the file the first time obviously is slow, but because you download it in, in the back, but it's not, not that slow these days anymore if you have a good connection. Um, as I said, I tried the first one um, to, to start LibreOffice. I didn't try it on this one yet, but uh, the hard part is again the last thing because you you have uh, the local file cache and the fuse mount, and it works against a local uh, Git repository, which of course is not what you want. You want the Git repository rem remote, so you need, again, another fuse mount or something to get this remote. So you have this uh, Frankenstein combination of two, two fuse mount on top of each other, but I don't think it will hurt the performance much because most, most of the uh, accesses will be directly to the first thing. But then you can use uh, HTTP or uh, SSH to mount this uh, second thing. Um, there are a few challenges there. For example, setting uh, the file system is a bit tricky. Um, for most, most of the time, I, it's a read-only file system, so I just created uh, fake, uh, fake stat like access bits and stuff like that. Um, but for example, the, the size uh, of a file in Git is not stored in the tree node. So to find out how, how big a file is, you actually have to download it right now. So that, you need some modification there to actually have local tree-ish tree objects that also have the, the file size of the tree node in them so that not stating a file uh, 
need, makes you download it on the fly. Uh, the second thing is if you want to uh, have insecure protocols like, um, so you just want to, for example, have this on HTTP, um, then it would be great to have um, a Git tag which creates a signature and then um, have all the um, objects in between uh, signed and with hash hashes of the contents so that uh, once you have checked the sign of the uh, the signage of the of the tech you're you're sure that everything else is not uh, somewhere men in the middle or something and then once you have all that you can you can think about garbage collection like you have two checkouts and you're running one and the other one you're keeping it around at some point you just want to delete that because no one is using it anymore or quotas or how big your local cache will be and all that fun but that's for later um, so this is roughly the state where this is in I would have loved to say that I could uh, start or that I did start LibreOffice remotely already on on the new implementation but I didn't get around to do that but I hope hope I can do this soon and then you could actually do a bye bye sect against the remote repository without having to download 10 or 20 gigs, but just like for the first step, you download a 75 max. For the second step, you maybe download another 30 max. And once uh, the next time, you will again have likely these two first steps, because I mean, the starting point of a bisect is mostly always the same. So you can dynamically or on the fly download the repository as you need it and not have to download it uh, in one step. So again, uh, I have no clue what, I've, what I'm talking about here mostly. So uh, originally I wanted to get others to actually do the work for me. That didn't work out, so I have to do it myself now. Um, luckily this, this stuff is uh, solved for for application uh, deployment with uh, solutions like Ubuntu Snappy, but for, for us, the specific requirements are a bit different. So um, um, I'm still hoping that I can finish this at some point. All right, questions? None. Oh, yeah. Couldn't you uh, leverage the git shallow uh, uh, checkout to do this? Um, uh, how do you want to uh, use git shadow for that? Well, if you just want to have one uh, specific version, if you do git shallow, that at least is smaller. And I don't know well enough, I just looked through the yeah. manual. Maybe uh, the, you can shallow when yeah. it fetches. What, what you could do is do something like, again, have the Git repository on an SSH FS mount or something like that, and then git shallow into that, uh, and have the local copy different. But the disadvantage of that would be when you do the first checkout, you do full checkout. So you get the whole, that whole, all files from that, although you only need like a third of those. So yeah, it's 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 another solution one might attempt, but yeah. yeah. Other questions? Another question, a request. Uh, we have enough time. Could you do a quick demo? Uh, no, but uh, actually, I can show you the uh, repository link. Thank you. So, <laughs> so the, it, it, this this stuff has also has unlike the first attempt uh, has has uh, quite a few tests. So uh, you can see what it should do, and if it doesn't, you see <laughs> uh, that it doesn't. So, <laughs> Clough. Uh, did you also consider just going the waste disk space route and just uh, create a version of, on the server that has the different versions in separate directories and just switch to the directory on your local mount? So uh, you mean like having, having the 
complete thing on the server, and then, yeah, no, I haven't considered that, but it's another option to go forward. Uh, but given how, how, how the compression of, uh, of Git is with uh, 16 max per checkout instead of 250 max, that's quite, quite, a bit diff quite a difference that you would lose there. So. I have a question. Uh, Armin? What, what about uh, if you uh, m marriage uh, Kloff's idea with checking out one version at the server and mounting that locally? Sorry? Uh, you could check out one specific version on the server to a temp directory and mount that locally? Yes, but then you would need one temp. Yeah, you could do that as a server. One, one temp there per user, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that requires the user to be able to uh, to trigger changes and stuff on the server, which uh, is admin admin stuff that I didn't want to get involved. My idea here was to uh, have the admin side like just dead file system and uh, be done with it. But uh, I see there are lots of great ideas here, so <laughs> go ahead, implement them. This is just a hobby of mine, so <laughs> as you can see from the time frames that, that are involved. Um, so thank you. <laughs>